My name is Clara Atkins Pope. I'm one of the organists at Christ Episcopal Church here in Harlan, also known as Christ Church Harlan, and I serve as clerk of vestry, which is the governing body of Christ Episcopal Church. So I'm gonna give you a little bit about the history of Christ Episcopal Church, and much of this was garnered from articles in, written in the Harlan Daily Enterprise from the 1930s. So the beginnings of Christ Episcopal Church began with the opening of the coal fields in 1913, when people from all over the nation began to come into Harlan to open up mines. And that was the same for some of the founding fathers of this church, the Whitfields. Uh, one of the Mr. Whitfields approached Reverend Thomas Settles, who was then rector of Church of the Good Shepherd in Lexington, Kentucky, and asked him to come to Harlan and take charge of the Epis work of the Episcopal Church in the Harlan County coal fields. Early services were held in the public school auditorium that's just across the street. The early Harlan Public City School Auditorium served as one of the places for the early services. Also, the community house at Clover Fork Coal Company at Kitts, and also in a building that was especially erected at Brookside by the Harlan, Harlan Collieries Company. Services were held in all three places. During the years March 1990, 1927 through April 1929, Deaconess Gertrude Baker of the United Thank Offering Fund of the National Council came to work with this new Episcopal Church. She taught Sunday school classes at both locations, Kitts and at Brookside. During this time period, a lot was purchased, this lot right here where we stand, for a cost of $5,000 on the corner of Williams and what was then known as Center Streets. Now it's known as Central Street. Reverend Settles took up residence in Harlan in October 1st, 1929, beginning regular Sunday services in the Margie Grand Theater, which was located downtown on um, 2nd Street. In 1930, the members of the mission decided to build a church. The architects were chosen, J. Graham Miller of Miller and Graffs of Lexington, Kentucky. The first spade of ground was turned by Amy Keyes Whitfield. Her mother, Mrs. B.W. Whitfield, is known for being responsible for the real beginning of the Episcopal Church in Harlan. The first stone was laid on July 19, 1930. The cornerstone right here was placed on September 5, 1930. So as we enter into the church, this very first portion is called in this tradition of architecture either the narthex or the vestibule. And if you turn around while we're here, you can see one of the original stained glass windows. It's called a rose window. So we enter through into the narthex or the vestibule and also it's called the entrance. And then we come into the nave of the church and the nave is constructed like a ship so that the bottom of the ship is floating from the heavens down to the earth, ministering from the heavens to the earth. In this style of architecture, this is called the transept. And in larger churches, the choir would be separate from the transept, but in our church, the choir, which includes the organ, is part of the transept. Right here, this is called the chancel. And then this portion behind the altar, the altar and behind, is called the sanctuary. This portion of the altar, behind the wooden, the wooden walls, behind the altar, which is this portion, and all of this decorative, sometimes it can be very, very decorative in Episcopal churches, in Anglican churches, is called the Reredos. And this Reredos replaced the original Reredos as a gift by William P. Burns, our rector in the 60s and early 70s, as a, as a parting gift to Christ Church. The organ was built by Henry Pilcher and Sons in 1889 in Louisville, Kentucky. It's a tracker organ which, with one manual, with seven stops and 393 metal and wooden pipes. In a tracker organ, the valve, which admits air to the pipe in order to produce the sound, is directly controlled by the force of the organist's finger on the keys. Basically, the organist must overcome the wind pressure resistant on each valve in order to open it and play the pipe. In a tracker organ, the console 
must remain relatively close to the pipes and the wind chest. Most tracker organs have the console built as an integral part of the organ's case. The console must be no more than a few feet from the pipes. Tracker organs originated hundreds of years ago. J.S. Bach and George Frederick Handel likely performed on tracker organs. These organs are very suitable, therefore, to the performance of what we call early music, Renaissance, and Baroque. In the oldest of tracker organs, the wind was pumped into the pipes manually by someone who pushed a bellows up and down, or either heated air was pushed over a fire to swell the bellows while the organist played. In this tracker organ, an electric air pump blows the air into the pipes. The use of this original organ was abandoned in the mid-1940s and was replaced by an electric Hammond organ, which became very popular as musical styles changed and developed into rock and roll. The keyboard and console were covered over with flooring, and the Hammond organ sat atop this with the organist facing the congregation. The Hammond organ was in use until 1994-95, when the organ as you see it now was restored by B. Rule and Company of Newmarket, Tennessee. The visible facades of the organ pipes were repainted in the original Victorian style by Charles Parker Boggs. When was the church founded? This church, the Christ Church Harlan, uh, the Episcopal Church, uh, started meeting in 1917 here in Harlan, but the church itself, this building, was not built until 1930. And so they made it, met in various places in Harlan, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, and the old Marja Grand Theater, and at Kitts Coal Company, and at uh, Harlan, uh, at Brookside, they met in different places. But the building that we're in here today was built in 1930. And that's when the organ was originally installed here in this building, was in 1930. Uh, what are the specifications of the pipe organ? This uh, pipe organ uh, here was built originally in 1889. So in 1889, it was built for a church in Lexington that closed. That church was called St. John's. Uh, the pipe organ uh, was built in 1889. It was there for about uh, 25 years. And then that church closed. The organ was put into storage and it moved to Harlan when this building was built in 1930. So uh, it's original in almost every way, except uh, it was restored in 1995. So there was a period of time when it was not used after the mid-1940s until 1995. So it was almost 40 some years that these pipes did not speak or make any sound. Uh, and the, because the church had installed this organ over a cold fired furnace, and that was a bad uh, place uh, to have a pipe organ over a fire, coal fired furnace because of the changes in heat uh, and humidity and temperature, of course, and then just the coal dust. So, um, uh, it wasn't used, and then it was restored by B. Rule uh, organ builders from Newmarket, Tennessee in 1995. Now, you ask about the specifications. The uh, stops, and I have those written down for you on a piece of paper that we, uh, I can tell you exactly what they are. Uh, the, uh, it has what we call eight ranks. Let me see here. It has, uh, the manual has 61 notes, and so there's the eight foot open diapason, the eight foot dulciana, eight foot melodia, the eight foot gamba, four foot harmonic flute, four foot octave, and a two fifteenth, uh, uh, which is a two foot, two foot which is a very high pitch. Smaller the pipes, uh, the higher the pitch. And then the uh, pedals 
are six, they're called 16 foot boardings. And so there are 27 pedals that are wooden and those uh, pedal uh, pipes for the 16 foot board are constructed and made from uh, chestnut, from chestnut wood. So those were the specifications for it. This organ was built for church use uh, to, to accompany hymns. That was its main purpose. Uh, and so it's not a huge organ, but uh, it certainly fills this space when all, the, when all of those uh, uh, pipes, which I think if I've counted and done my math right, that's 393 pipes. Um, 393 metal pipes plus uh, 27 wooden pipes. So there's over uh, 410 pipes in the organ. So it has, a, it's all contained on one keyboard of ivory. Uh, of course, the stop pulls are ivory. And then um, these pipes that you see, the facade pipes, they actually do speak. Uh, they, they make, they're not just for decorations. However, when they were, were restored, uh, they were restored uh, to uh, look exactly the way they would have looked during the uh, Victorian period of time. The artist who, who did that work, who did the stenciling work, was my nephew Charles Parker Boggs. Uh, and he had re was working on his master's in art at the University of North Carolina, and he took that as a project. And he too is an Eagle Scout, and is an Eagle Scout, and is a Scout Master uh, in Hazard. So, uh, so those pipes were were restored with uh, the original color paint, original type of paint, and the gold bands are 22 uh, karat gold leaf. To wrap up, what are the church's favorite hymns? The church uh, likes, uh, has a variety of hymns that they like. I'll have to say, you know, this, the Episcopal Church came from the Church of England, and it was from that tradition that Amazing Grace uh, was written. It was written by uh, an English uh, Anglican Church uh, minister, which was the predecessor of the Episcopal Church. Uh, before the American Revolution, we were called the Church of England. Uh, and then after the revolution, that wasn't a very, uh, very uh, politically correct title to be called the Church of England. So we, were, we changed it to Episcopal, which means Bishop Church. And so um, Amazing Grace is one, is one that we like to sing. We also like to sing uh, 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 Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God uh, and All of Its Righteousness. Um, and then all the old traditionals. They're more traditional type organ music and hymns, but the, still have the favorites that were written in the 20th century.